Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Hot for Teacher. I guess, I guess in this in this naming convention, I'm teacher, and since I'm the one making the statement, I guess this is sort of narcissistic of me to call the show Hot for. You know what? It's too late now. We're 37 episodes in, and this is what we're doing. I'm not going to change the name of it partway through. We're going to stay the course. Uh, if this is f- for you. The first time you've watched this, if you're if you're tuning in and you're thinking, what is going on here? What is a hot for teacher? Well, let me tell you, it's a lot like office hours. But instead of role playing game questions, I answer and we discuss. Relationship questions. So people uh, people have thoughts, they have confusions, they have complications in their life about their relationships with their friends, their coworkers, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, And so what we do right here, every time we do an episode, is we discuss those things. We pick three questions from the pool, uh, and we devote about 20 minutes to each question. We just hang out, and we, we chat about it. My goal in Hot for Teacher is, of course, to just get people talking about things. Um, it's it's not just about, like, you have a problem, I'm going to solve it. And then everybody who just thought of the lyrics to Ice, Ice Baby, I'm sorry for that. But the problem here is that it's not about solving problems because relationship issues, stuff that, that comes up, you can't just solve it in 20 minutes most of the time, right? Sometimes I will try to. Sometimes I'll say, dump them or quit that job or whatever. But obviously these things are more nuanced. So the goal here is to really just bring these things up start the discussion, and then hopefully whether you are the person asking the question or you are somebody who is uh, interested in the asking, maybe it relates to you in some way, it resonates with you personally, take this as the starting point for a larger conversation, right? Communicate with your friends and your coworkers and your relatives and the people you're in relationships with and have these conversations yourself. I would like, if nothing else, to encourage you to take that away from today's episode. The things that we talk about here... Let them coagulate in your brain and then bring them up with the people around you. If you have a question or you have a topic, something you would like to submit for an episode of Hot for Teacher, you can do that at www.adam-coble.com. There's a Hot for Teacher link. You just click it, fill out the form, and uh, and ask your question or bring up your topic. And we will, we will find, uh, hopefully, a chance to discuss it or a question very much like it uh, in a future episode. So... Our first question uh, today comes to us from Carl. Uh, Carl has a question, and unfortunately, Carl's question is not about the specter that is haunting Europe uh, or about the workers and their chains. This is a different Carl, but this Carl is also socially minded. Let's let's take a look at Carl's question here. So Carl begins with, I am a straight, cis, white man in the US. I appreciate that I was born into a privileged situation and I consider myself an ally of the LGBTQ community. I believe equality is everyone's right. I work as an electrician in the construction industry. It's a very masculine, conservative environment. Hate speech is often used, and it makes me angry. Good, yes, it it should. Part of me wants to stand up and affect what change I can in my workplace. Another part of me is afraid of being cut from the pack and isolated at work. I feel a sense of guilt for not standing up for my principles. What advice do you have for handling this situation? Thanks. For your help. So you're get you're getting there, Carl. You you're getting there, right? Like like you you have within you the the seed of change. Uh and and that's good. It's good that you recognize that you are in a privileged position. But the, the thing about recognizing privilege, being like, yes, that's true. I do have a ton of of socially mandated advantages that other people might not have. That's that's the first step, right? Recognizing that. And that's good. It's good that you can do that because a lot of people just don't or refuse to acknowledge that. And not because not because it's it's obfuscated, not because it's a difficult thing to see. I think if you take even a moment to look at the ways in which the society or the culture you live pushes you to a position of of power or authority. It's pretty easy to do, but it's that next step 
that people are afraid of. Because if you acknowledge that you have privilege, you then need to acknowledge what your responsibility is to people that don't, right? The idea of to what do we owe one another is the question to answer here. And the trick that that I think a lot of people run into when they have that revelation is realizing, okay, so I have these advantages uh, because of the color of my skin, because of my gender, because of a lot of things or a lot of reasons that people may or may not have privilege in society. But when you recognize them, you then have to do something with that. These are not simply acknowledgements of an unchangeable reality. It's not simply enough to say, yes, this is true. I have these advantages. Now what? You have to say, all right, here is what I can do with these advantages to help other people. Now, I am not your conscience, Carl, right? Nobody is. I am not here to tell you what to do because ultimately that's going to be on you. But I think that if you consider yourself to be an ally, you should, in theory, then act accordingly, right? You want to do things that will make other people recognize that, yes, you are indeed an ally. Because simply saying, I consider myself an ally, why? Why Why do you, why? Why do you consider yourself that, right? I'm not necessarily questioning it because I don't know you or what you do every day, but like, why? Why is that something you consider, right? Because I think that there's this thing where we philosophically identify as as allies. You can say like, I... I am an ally to people of color. I am an ally to black folks. I am an ally to disabled people. I am an ally to people of genders that are not my own, et cetera, et cetera. And you can, you can make all of these assertions about yourself, but, but why, right? I think we, we get in our head that sometimes that allyship, the idea of being someone who supports people with less privilege than us, we, we think of it as like an identity or a, a, a uniform we can don when we need to, but it's not really. It's, it's, a, it's a thing that is performed. It is a behavior, right? And like so much discourse within sort of social justice spaces or conversational spaces at all, Uh, around these issues, I think ally, as with many terms, has kind of fallen apart. It sort of doesn't really mean anything, especially if it's self-assigned, right? Um, It's like saying, uh, I am a good person, which like, okay, but how, right? And so you, you answer that question, right? You are, Carl, standing at the precipice of proving ultimately to yourself, because Really, that's what this is about. You are you are standing at the precipice of potential. You can prove to yourself and to the people around you that you are an ally. You can do allied things. And and in this case, it's standing up to bigots. It's standing up to bigotry. It's it's saying something when your privilege allows for silence. Right. So keep keep in mind here, Carl and people who might be in a similar situation. I, I've been in Carl's position. We'll talk about that a bit later. But what you have to remember here, uh, Carl, is that your privilege allows you the ability to do nothing. That is part of of what that privilege does. Right. It allows you to recognize there is Let's be real. Hateful villainy. There is evil in the world. Evil close to you. You are angry. And yet you can do nothing. You can choose to do nothing at all. Um, It will not impact your life. In fact, it will likely benefit you to continue doing nothing. Right. If you say nothing, if you don't confront the bigots in your workplace, your job will continue as it is. There will be no risk to that job. Uh, and, and you could theoretically just carry on with your life, pushing that sense of guilt down until either, I don't know, you get an ulcer or it evaporates and you become a bad person. (laughs) Now, I don't want that for you, Carl and Carl, you don't want that for you either. And I think choosing to act on that, choosing to take that risk 
is the difference between considering yourself an ally and being someone who is actively fighting against bigotry in the world, right? And now I get that it's I get that it's scary, right? I get that that from a position of privilege it can look like a scary thing to take that risk. You might lose your job. You might be isolated from a bunch of like hateful jerks, which doesn't seem too bad to me, but like I get that you you have to get by uh at at work. Um but you have to remember too that your ability to recover from that is also much much higher right like let's let's say let's let's imagine let's imagine like a a bad scenario for you right so let's imagine that somebody at work says something hateful they use a a, a racist slur or uh they they say something uh, bigoted towards uh lgbt people say they, they say something that that triggers that feeling of wait a second like this isn't right i i am upset about this hearing this reminds me that there is bad shit in the world and i want to do something about it and you you stand up you say hey when you say things like that, you know it makes you sound like a Nazi, right? Like that kind of speech is harmful, it's bigoted, and you are you are making the world a worse place by propagating it. Stop it. Let's say you say that. So you start getting ostracized. Uh, everybody at your work treats you like you are a, a delicate, uh, sensitive snowflake, right? Everybody starts being a dick to you, and uh, suddenly you don't like going to work anymore because you stood up for what you believe in, and everybody was a jerk about it. Um, this makes it hard for you to work. Uh, you you start thinking about quitting your job, and maybe you maybe you can't get along, and maybe it gets to a point where you get fired. Maybe maybe it just makes your work relationship with these other people so bad. So, so bad that your boss notices and uh, eventually it leads to you getting fired, right? Let's say that's maybe that's the worst situation uh, that, that you're going to face, right? Is, is loss, loss of your job. The thing about privilege, Carl, is that the whole system, right? The whole system exists predominantly to benefit you. So finding another job is gonna be easier for you than all of the people that you consider yourself to be an ally to, right? So if you do get fired, you can just go out, and I'm, I don't mean to minimalize how much work it is to get a job, even for people who are in a position where it's much easier, but the, the thing is, right, the thing is that you are advantaged in that capacity, right? Even if it feels like you aren't, you are. The system, it exists to support you. So consider what it would look like if you just left the people you are allies to to defend themselves. Let's imagine instead, let's, let's flip this. Let's say you do nothing. And one of your coworkers, and maybe they're in the closet, right? Maybe you have a gay coworker, and this person has to continually be subjected every day to homophobic language at work, right? And your gay, your gay coworker constantly, every day, eight hours a day, has to fear being exposed to, uh, to hate speech, right? And let's imagine that they don't do anything about it. Uh, they're in that position that you are afraid of being in, right? You're looking across the gulf of isolation and they are already cut from the pack, isolated at work and feeling, imagine the, the guilt that they feel at not standing up for themselves, right? So they're suffering a lot worse than you will in that same situation. And you could be letting that happen by saying nothing, right? So now this person is either going to suffer so much that it's going to affect their mental health, their emotional stability, and it can lead to self-harm. It can lead to very serious permanent effects for them. Or if they choose to stand up, it's a huge risk, right? Imagine this person says, listen, guys, I'm sick of all this homophobia. I'm gay. Fuck you. That person exposes themselves to very real violence, right? 
this masculine conservative environment they're in, if they stand up for themselves, they are at they are at massive risk. So I think I think the only truly ethical thing to do is to stand up for people that you are an ally to, like to take that risk and to recognize that the worst case scenario for you is nowhere near the worst case scenario for people who are already suffering with this stuff. And I know, I know it's really scary. I know it's hard. And, and I have absolutely been in that position. I have, I worked in advertising and I worked around a lot of people who were pretty ignorant. Sexism was rampant, homophobia, like these things came up time and time again. And it often felt like I was the only one saying or doing anything. I feel like I was the only one standing up for people uh, and ultimately standing up for myself, right? I wasn't in the closet and it it definitely isolated me. It, it made me have to be the one that constantly said something and ultimately it did lead to my my leaving the job right I couldn't I couldn't do that I couldn't be in that environment anymore and when I stepped away I had support networks I had systems in place because of my privilege that allowed me to bounce back and create a new career and essentially start again from nothing and that's why I am where I am right the the structures of of the society I live in exist to benefit people like me and I have to actively as you do Carl give that privilege away use the voice that you have people will listen to you they will take you seriously and they will they will pay attention to the words that you say more than they will the the words of say women or non-binary people or trans people or black people or people of color or etc 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 right there are you are at the top of a pyramid and you need to recognize that there is no way for the people who are being systematically placed at the bottom of that pyramid to rise above it on their own, right? You need to, you need to give away some of that, of that privilege. And this is, this is like a fundamentally difficult thing for human beings to do, right? It's a very challenging, like I'm not, I'm not undermining the, the struggle that Carl is going through. There is a very real psychological and sociological pressure once you have power not to let it go right we we want it we work our whole lives because power makes us feel safe safety allows us to relax and nobody wants to run stressed all the time but you have to recognize that that that's the reality that a lot of people are going through the people that don't have that power people who are not at the top of that pyramid don't have the luxury of relaxing Right. They are subjected to that kind of hateful stuff all the time. And for you, hate speech makes you angry. And that's good. That is a, a completely appropriate response to being around hateful talk. Right. But think about. How other people have to deal with bigotry. Right. Think about the real like physical danger that people are in. Think about the kinds of high level, heavy social counterweight that applies to people who are simply existing, right? There are entire structures of power that think that they just shouldn't exist. So, I think the thing is, Carl, is that probably the people that you are around are simply reinforcing each other's behavior because nobody has ever said like, hey, like fucking shut up. You can't talk like that. Like that is harmful. You are making the world a worse place by by having this conversation. Right. Your anger without action. Right. Right. Your anger means nothing. Let it light a fire of change within you, right? Let that anger turn into something. Think about ways in which you have earned 
that label of of ally, right? You can't give it to yourself. You may consider yourself it, but you got to do the thing, right? So let let that anger turn into action. Let that anger lead you to speak up, say something, right? Be be brave. Use your use your privilege. Um, and you know, me saying this to Carl is it's I'm not just talking to Carl, right? I'm talking to everybody who's in Carl's position. And to a degree, I'm, I'm reminding myself of this too. This is an, an always struggle, right? Like, am I am I looking at am I looking down from the top of the pyramid thinking, boy, what a good what a good job I'm doing? Or am I actually doing things to reach down and pull people up? Am I attempting to dismantle that pyramid? Because the pyramid is the problem, right? The structure is the problem. It's not just individual people. It's the reasons why the people you work with think it's OK to just casually use hate speech in a job environment. Right now, there are. Like as a as an aside, in Carl's case particularly, there are laws in place to prevent these kinds of things from happening, right? There are technically laws that that mean that that you know you should not be able to be fired for speaking up and that hate speech in the workplace is not allowed. And those laws, while they don't work perfectly, the people they serve best, the people they were designed to serve, are you. Carl. So you have, again, the power of the whole structural pyramid on your side. Fucking use it. Right. Get out there and 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 you use it. Right. So my advice is listen to that feeling of guilt. Stand up for your principles. Be be an ally. Don't just think of yourself as one. And 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 whether whether the suffering you are going to have to go through as a result. I think the thing to remember, too, is that, Carl, you're probably not alone. There are probably. There are probably other people. There are probably other people in that space that agree with you, but who are too afraid to say anything. So speak up. Take the lead. You're probably not alone. And even if you are, it, to me, it feels like the right thing to do. But Carl, you have to you have to come to you have to come to terms uh, with that that feeling. I will say you are right to be angry. You are right to feel guilty. And I hope that I hope that this is something that you can feel like brave enough to step forward and, and say something about. But I get I get that it's scary. But ultimately, the advice here is just. You have to get over that fear because while you're afraid for your job or afraid for being socially ostracized, there are people out there who are afraid for their lives. So for you. It seems like a it seems like a given maybe for me. But it's a good question, Carl, and I'm really glad you brought it up. I think a lot of people in Carl's position probably just think, no, no, I'm doing fine. I'm I posted about it on Facebook. I uh, I went to the pride parade. I'm a good ally. I think a lot of people don't get as far as even Carl did in asking this question. I don't want to undermine that. Right. So I don't know. Think about it. Carl and people who are similar to Carl find ways you can use the privilege you have to raise people up. Help combat that masculine conservative environment that you are in. Uh, our second question is about communication. It comes from Luna. So Luna asks, I'm well aware that communication is important in every relationship. Good start, Luna. And I've always tried my hardest at having a conversation, but there was always this wall between myself and the doing of conversing. Recently, uh, I've been diagnosed as someone who's on the autism spectrum. And well, that explains a lot about myself. Since then, I've talked with one of my closest friends and the two of us found a system where we vocalize anything that another person would normally be able to pick up using social cues and whatnot. While this has greatly improved our relationship and conversations, I know this isn't possible with everyone. So my question is, how would you go about asking how someone is doing without them thinking it's just a generic greeting or have them think that you think something is wrong? I love this question. This is the I love you scenario. This is the um, the whole like it 
it bothers me how much we just assume that we are communicating. Uh, every time I hear someone say 90% of communication is body language, I just want to light them and their ideas on fire. Um, everybody communicates differently. Uh, there is an assumption that everyone communicates the same, and we operate on that assumption on a whole bunch of different levels. Um, we, we assume that people will understand our tone of voice, our body language, our choice of words. We assume that uh, people will understand our idioms. Uh, a lot of time we assume people will understand the language that we are speaking. We assume people can hear. We assume that people share the same cultural background as us. And we just thrust forth our feelings and thoughts at them under the auspices that they will decipher them. And I think that in a lot of cases, that assumption can like get us by. We can we can just kind of like push through and uh, and and make those assumptions. And like we get this surface level, not really communication thing. And this is what results in stuff like. Hey, how you doing? Oh, good. And then the person who said good goes and eats their lunch alone in the bathroom while crying. Right. They're not good. They're not. They just that's just the back and forth. Um and uh, and that's that's just there's like a cultural assumption that we all kind of are taught to follow for the sake of expediency. But I say, fuck expediency. Fuck it. Language is a beautiful, nuanced palette. In an infinitum of of colors and shades, right? There is no reason that we should force ourselves to limit what we express to one another to a handful of pre-assumed phrases, right? This is the... This is the kind of thing that leads to, like, new speak, right? This idea that uh, we should have one language, we should make it as efficient as possible, and that communication is purely for the exchange of content. When that's not really the case. Like, communication, yes, is extremely important in conveying the things that we think and feel to one another. In fact, it's the only way we can do that. It's super important for establishing boundaries, for getting to know people, like, our ability to speak and to hear and to translate sound into language, language into ideas and back, all of that stuff is fundamental to what makes us human, but it doesn't mean that we all have to do it the same way, right? You can see this in linguistics, in things like Esperanto, the idea that someone thought we should just invent a language that is the easiest language for everyone to learn, we should all learn Esperanto, and we should throw out all of the other languages. We should just ban English and Japanese and Mandarin, and we should just throw them all out in favor of Esperanto, which is like... I guess if you want to convey information and that's it and you want to lose cultural nuance and you want to throw all that stuff out, okay, but that, I'm not really interested in that, right? And then fairly quickly, we would get we would get dialects of Esperanto and we would get, you know, like there are reasons why communication styles exist. There's reasons why uh, code switching is a thing. Language does more than just convey information. And if you're relying on nonverbal cues to get that information, right? If you look at words as conveying baseline info and everything else is conveying subtext, people on the autism spectrum can sometimes get cut off from that subtext. And you can you can lose out. You're you're trying to speak a language that seems like the language everyone else is speaking, right? You're speaking English, they're speaking English. You're speaking Danish, they're speaking Danish. You should be able to communicate, but they're speaking Danish neurotypically and you're not. And so you can get into these situations where you say, how are you doing? And they say, fine. And you're like, what? Like, I, I want to know, I want to know how you're doing. Like, I'm asking you because I want... <laughs> 
I want more. I want to know what's going on with you. This is a meaningful question, but they're hearing, they're hearing like, oh, this is the, this is my cue to say, oh, I'm fine. Right? So what is, what is the answer to this? What is the, what is the solution? So I think first of all, recognizing that there is a baseline default communication assumption and that you are not participating in it. See that neutrally, right? Don't, don't judge yourself. Don't judge other people for it. Like recognize that this is an act that people go through. And while the words might mean something, it's the, it's the invisible dance between those words that you're, that they're really looking for, right? Hi, how are you doing? Hello, I'm fine. It's not conveying emotional information. It's a greeting. And it's unfairly, it sounds like something that it's not, right? And so I think, I think that what you're doing by creating your own method of interacting with someone, right? This, this work you did with your closest friends, creating a system to vocalize things that other people would assume, that is fucking awesome, that's awesome because what you're doing is you're you're showing people the way you want to communicate and you're asking them to communicate with you in the same way. Think about it this way, okay? So let's imagine everyone around you speaks German. Let's imagine you're, I don't know, in Germany. Everyone around you speaks German. You don't speak German. You speak Swahili. And... You go to ask somebody something in Swahili and they answer you in German. And you say, please speak Swahili to me. I don't understand you. Now, they speak Swahili, this person you're talking to. But because it's easier for them to just keep speaking German, because everyone else they know speaks German, they might pressure you to say, you know what? You should just learn German like the rest of us. And you're like, no, but the things I want to communicate, the things I need to communicate to you, I can only communicate to you in Swahili. Please speak Swahili with me. And they're like, no, 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 I refuse. Sorry, I'm not going to. We could, we could have a meaningful conversation that would be useful and helpful for both of you, right? But, but they refuse. They're like, no, no, I'm going to keep speaking German until you figure it out. Because you and your Swahili are weird and I don't like it, right? I feel alienated by you making me speak Swahili, right? So the analogy here is that everyone around you is speaking neurotypical English and you're not. You need them to communicate with you in another way so that you can have the meaningful interaction that they need. The thing is, they don't even need to learn Swahili. It's not that hard. They just need to say the things that they probably don't even realize they're not saying, so, I think the best thing to do here is recognize that this is work, right? Recognize that this is going to be work on your part and that where we are right now, like generally as a, a broad kind of culture, the idea of stating the unstated and working to uh to to communicate with people and meet them where they need us to be uh might be hard for people. Uh it's going to be hard for you to ask because it like with Carl, it can be alienating, it can be uh people might look at you funny, like people are just not adequately educated about neurotypicality and how it works and the autism spectrum and all of this stuff. They just they're ignorant. They just don't have the qualification yet to to get to that place where you are right but that doesn't mean that you have to learn fucking german right this just means you have to choose how deeply you want to go with people right remember that you don't have to communicate meaningfully with everybody you don't have to communicate meaningfully with your coworkers you don't have to communicate meaningfully with randos on the bus like you get to choose you can put on that like, I get it, we are acting, that, that, that act of like, hello, how are you? And you can expect 
that answer. It's a little, it's a game, right? It's not real, and you can recognize that, and you can still play the game. In the same way that, like, think of it as, like, think of it as a LARP, right? So you're going to LARP as, uh, as a neurotypical person for the purposes of conversations that just don't matter, right? That you can just get through. Um, and then for everybody else, and you get to decide how many people this is, how big this fear is, but for everybody else, I think that you should consider yourself valuable and worthwhile enough to ask them for a little extra effort, right? I called this, and it's it's exhausting, I know, I understand, and, and you have to decide how much emotional energy you have for this bullshit. Um, but, but for me, right, I... My my struggle with this is absolutely not the same as yours or as as like deep as your struggle. But I am not a fan of um, uh, of of unclear language. It's very confusing for me and I find it frustrating and it makes me uncomfortable when people say things assuming that I know what they mean. This phrase uh, this this is most often triggered for me by the phrase I love you. Um, there is a dance you are supposed to be performing when someone says that. You should already know your move. When someone says, I love you, you're supposed to say, I love you too, and you're supposed to just know how that works. It is not romantic to say, what do you mean by that? But you kind of have to. Right. I feel like for that statement to have any value in the same way that the statement or the question, how are you doing for it to have value? You have to understand what the person saying it actually means. Um, and you know what? I don't. It's it's not even like. It's not even the thing. The thing for me is not even frustrating when people are being intentionally obscure. Like I can tell, I can tell when people are being uh, strange or when they're using a, a dialect or a sub uh, cultural uh, language that I don't understand. Like I get when that's happening. Right. I get when people are memeing or whatever and I don't get it and that's fine. It's the it's the like assumption that I should know what you mean. That's the part that that throws me off. And I, I think that that's that's sort of the case for Luna. And I think a lot of people have this problem, too. So, like, you're doing it. You're already doing it. You're finding you're finding the people that matter enough to you to communicate with. And you are exchanging information about how to communicate better. And that's always good. Your communication skills, you want to be leveling those up your whole life and you want to bring people along for the ride if you can. But recognize that it's going to be work for strangers and sometimes you got to LARP like a neurotypical. You got to play that game in the same way that sometimes people have to have to speak a different language to get by. Right. It's a form of code switching, I think, where. You have to you can play that game enough to get through conversations that don't matter, but the conversations that do matter. Talk to people, tell them, like, say, hey, when I ask you how you're doing, I actually want to know. Like, it's not because I think something's wrong and it's I don't use that phrase loosely. I like legitimately am curious about. How's your life going? Right. So again, as with Carl's question, it's about choosing how much energy you want to put in, picking your battles and hopefully Luna the, the neurotypical folks that are around you, your friends, your family, your loved ones, hopefully they will meet you where you are at when you express to them you need their help. When you reach out to them, when you offer, and this is the thing, you are not demanding anything of them, right? By saying, I need to be able to communicate with you better, here are the ways, don't consider it something you are making them do work, consider it an offering because what they get, what they get out of doing that work is closer to you and you are, you are valuable, right? You are worth being close to. And if you reach out and offer people, here is a way to get closer to me. 
I have to believe that they will be ready to jump on that. I have to believe that they are excited and that they want that. Because if I had a friend come to me and say, hey, here are some things that we could do to be closer as people. Assuming I like that person and want that, I would be super excited. That feels really cool to me. It's like whatever the opposite of a boundary is. It's like an open door. Like all you have to do is behave a certain way and you can you can you can come on in. You, you get to access to some part of your brain that, that you would you would never get access to before. And I think that's really valuable. I think it's 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 something that everybody neurotypical people should be doing this, too. We should be talking to each other and we should be. We should be considering how we can get closer to people and we should be doing this work, right? Not just not just Luna, but all of us, not just the people around Luna, but everybody all the time. Less Esperanto. More dialect. Right. And we already do this. Right. I bet you if you think about it, you you've got friends. Right. Um, you've got family, you got parents, you got coworkers, whatever. You have people with whom you share a secret part of language already. And I mean, everybody, not just Luna, but everybody. Right. I know that when I'm having a conversation with my brother, there are uh, there are things that we discuss and ways that we discuss them that I don't, there's language I use with my brother that I wouldn't use with anybody else because, and it's mostly Simpsons references, because we know we have that shared dialect, right? So your family, your culture, uh, your, your, your people, they're going to already have these dialects with you. So create individual dialects, create a shared language between you and your, and your friends and consider this not a disadvantage, consider this not a struggle, but an invitation to get to know you better. Start there, I guess. And for everybody else, think about, think about those dialects. Think about those languages, right? It's interesting because when I think about this, I think that this kind of thing is a thing that like as a white person, I struggle with a lot because I feel like we have like I don't have a, a culture, right? Probably for the best. Like, yeah, I could I could probably find some things in common with other like Canadians or, or English people. But that's a that's a national culture. We don't have like. Yeah. And so it's hard to understand. But I think a lot of people are raised with this already. Right. A lot of especially marginalized people like the gay subculture has its own language it has its own dialects it has its own way of communicating right um and and this is something that maybe we don't have connection to right uh and so it can be hard to understand but it's there and you're already doing it and everybody is so yeah language is so fascinating it's it's just such a it's such a cool thing and it causes us so much stress but when we can get our head around it we can really make it work whoo Whew, communicating is the best, the best. So our third question, this is one of those questions I'm going to, I'm going to read through the question. I'm going to give a flip answer and then we're going to talk more about it. Um, but I'm really curious to see what other people think. I've been going through a lot of changes lately and the big one I'd like to talk about is my first long-term serious relationship ending. We'd lived together for over a year when the breakup happened, and we still live together now, a month later. Whew. Yeah, boy. Ugh. At first, I tried my best to bridge the gaps that caused our relationship to fall apart and find something new that allowed us to still be close, but it's been very difficult to find a spot that doesn't hurt me emotionally and still allows for us to be close. We're no longer together and have no interest in going, interest in going back to that, but what we have now is very much unlike any other friendship that I have. What advice do you have for getting over my own loss and romantic attachment to someone that no longer feels the same way and for navigating a friendship that covers more space than you were used to for friendship, but much less than you were used to with that person? Evelyn. Get out of there. Run. Get out. <laughs> Get the fuck out of there. Go. Here's the thing. 
way, way too often. And I don't mean get out of there forever and ever and ever, but like for right now, get some space, right? Because you and this person had this very close, intense relationship and then decided that it wasn't working anymore. And now it's a part and it's this other thing and you still live together and you're around them all the time. Get the fuck out of there. And I mean that in two ways. I mean, you, you, you cannot, maybe you can, I don't know, but I don't think that it is safe for your mental and emotional well-being to continue living with this person, what are you going to do when they start dating somebody else? What are you going to do when they like bring somebody home and you're fucking sitting in the living room trying to watch America's Next Top Model and they're banging in the other room? What are you going to do then, Evelyn? It's going to suck. Right? It sucks now. It's going to suck more then. Get the fuck out of there. And once once you get out of there, let that physical space, let that physical space be reflected in your emotional and, and mental closeness, right? Get some distance. Don't hang out for a while. Don't text every day. Don't get drunk and send this person pictures of your butt. Don't, like, just... Just put some space in between you and breathe. Right? Just like go be a person who exists for herself. Go become best friends with Evelyn. You know, get some self love in. And I mean that in every conceivable sense of the word. Now, I will say. Because apparently structural horseshit is a common theme in today's episode. The. Jesus Christ, the mononormative cultural hegemon. Wants you to be partnered. The the structure of modern living wants you to be in a monogamous child producing straight cohabitating relationship the man wants you to fucking make babies right the man wants you to be in that kind of relationship because that leads to more babies that will lead to more people in that situation they want to continue that that situation now whether or not you buy into that is up to you. That is that is entirely your call. You can continue to be a mononormative, dyad-seeking uh, uh, cohabitator, but not with this person. Get the fuck out. The reason I bring this up is because it's probably very expensive and very difficult for you to get out of that situation, right? Rent presumes adults cohabitate, right? Living is expensive, so while you may not be able to simply say, see you later, asshole, I'm taking my shit and I'm moving out, and you just move into a place on your own in the city, you discover yourself, right? Maybe you can't do that, right? Maybe you could move in with some family. Maybe you can move home for a little bit, right? Go live with mom and dad. Go live with your friends. Find some friends looking for roommates, Find some friends whose friends are looking for roommates, right? Like, it's not going to be optimal because some part of your brain, the optimal solution is that you never broke up with this person. And as long as that feels like the optimal solution, you are in the wrong place and everything's fucked, right? Your relationship with this person, I wish you'd given me their name so that I could use it, but your relationship with this person is over. It is dead. And that's okay. Things die. Everything dies. Your relationship has expired. It is no longer pining for the fjords. So you have to let it die, right? Stop trying 
to drag it up and make it into something else, right? You can't. I think so often we try to go from, because we're scared to, to lose that intimacy. Being, being, having intimacy taken from us can be terrifying. It can be sad. It can be hurtful. It can make us feel hollow and broken and fucked up, right? And I'm not saying that you can't ever be friends, but the transition from deep-seated intimacy to less deep-seated intimacy without any interim period, uh, it's so fucking hard. It's so hard. So what I think you should probably do is take a step back from this person. Don't live with them. Don't try to be friends. Give yourself some space. You will learn that your life without this person is actually pretty good, right? Because you're cool. You're fun to be around. And you're interesting. Look at this as an opportunity to take some of that energy that you are giving to this person, right? Take some of that energy you are dedicating to this human being. Take it back, right? Now, go out all night. You don't have to text anybody. Tell them where you're at. You leave your pants on the floor. Nobody's going to tell you otherwise. Enjoy your relationship with you for a little bit. Right? Because in the end, Evelyn, you are alone. It doesn't matter how close you are to a person. It doesn't matter if you're married. It doesn't matter if you're in love. It doesn't matter if you've got kids. It doesn't matter if they are your kids. You have you. And in the end, there is no way to prevent other people from leaving you, right? In the end, there is no way to facilitate an existence where you are not alone. But the secret is, Evelyn, that's okay. Because if you recognize that, that your relationship with yourself is the only real relationship that you can have, you're only, the only truly meaningful person permanent relationship you can't get away from yourself it's the only permanent relationship you will ever have once you get good with that that means that every other relationship in your life should bring you up from that baseline no relationship should ever be below that line of being in a good space with yourself right so what you want to do is you've got this relationship that's fucking up your shit right now you have this person and you used to be allowed to be in love and now you're not allowed to be in love with them and you used to like probably like hold hands and and like do sex stuff and you were a couple and people recognized your joint identity and you were playing the dyadic cohabitation game and all that's over now and you are allowed to mourn it but you cannot mourn it there's a reason we don't hold funerals inside the grave kids you have to step back you have to let it die. And if you really care about this person, right? And if they really care about you, you're going to get to test that by building a new relationship with them later. And we've, we've talked about this. this is like, this is probably my favorite like truism about human beings, but you can't step in the same stream twice. You can't, be friends with the same person forever. People change. You change. So whatever person you become, Evelyn, after some time apart, and whatever person they become, those people might be allowed to have a new relationship. But I just, and this is just coming from my experience, I can't say it's not possible, but I'm going to try to discourage you from it. In my experience, going straight from deep, powerful intimacy to like a different form of intimacy with nothing in between, especially when you look at it as a step down or away or like something worse, that is hard because it will always look like 
It'll always look like a consolation prize. You don't want that, right? You don't want to look at your relationship and be like, well, this is fine, but it's not love. It's always going to drag your relationship down. And you deserve better than that. So I know it hurts. <laughs> I know, like I know it's hard. I know breaking up is hard. I know the loss is real. And like you deserve to mourn this relationship. You deserve to feel sad. You deserve to like be fucked up about it. And you deserve to do that outside of the sphere of the thing that is hurting you. Living with this person, I'm going to make a fucked up analogy here, but living with this person is like smoking a cigarette to make yourself feel better after the doctor just told you you have lung cancer. Don't, 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 don't do that. It's bad for you. So get out of there. Find a new place to live. Find people who will support you through the mourning process. Let yourself mourn and then build something new with this person. If it's still mad, you may, and I don't want to predict the future here. I'm not a, I'm not a fucking magic prognosticator, but I'm going to bet. I'm going to bet if you spend a bunch of time building yourself up, getting good with Evelyn and you come back with a clear head and you're like, I bet you I could be friends with, and I still don't have a fucking name for this. I mean, that guy, Brian, I don't know. I could be friends with Brian. You're going to have, you're going to sit down. You're going to have a meal with Brian. You're going to have a conversation. You're going to be like, wait a second. There's a bunch of stuff about this guy. I don't really like. <laughs> right you're gonna have a different perspective on him and you're gonna need to build if you choose you're gonna need to build a new relationship and maybe you won't want to or maybe maybe you'll be even more in love with Brian than you were before and that's okay too right but it's a new relationship it's something else built on the foundations of the old relationship built on the memories and the the emotional palimpsest of your previous relationship. You're never going to be free of that history and that's okay. But like get some room, get some space, then rebuild, right? Get over your loss, get over your romantic attachment by separating yourself from that situation. And like, yo, go be friends with Evelyn. Also, if you want to feel like altruistic about this, you're doing Brian a favor too. <laughs> you're doing you're doing a favor to this this person by giving them some space as well, right? Cuz they need this too. Nobody nobody wants you to be in that position where you're trying to watch America's Next Top Model while they bone. They don't want that. You don't want it. Nobody wants it. So I don't know, go have a relationship with Evelyn. She seems cool. So this has been episode 37 of Hot for Teacher. Uh, kind of a heavy one, not, maybe not the heaviest, but like a lot of thinking to be done about the, the structures that inform our relationships and the kinds of risks we might have to take to better ourselves and our, our relationships with people. Um, it's hard being a person. It's hard having feelings and thoughts and communicating them. And it's hard to drag yourself out of bed some days, but Hopefully, hopefully some of this helped or at least got you thinking about stuff. Um, uh, I want you to uh, I want you to keep thinking about it. I want it to stick in your head. I want you to have conversations, have a meaningful conversation with somebody. It doesn't have to be a long one, but like talk to them about the way you communicate or stand up for a marginalized person today. Like find an opportunity. Look at your relationship with yourself and the people around you and find ways to make it better. I believe in you. I think you can. Uh, if you need my help, though, you can ask for it at www.adam-coble.com. Click that Hopper Teacher link, fill out the form. 
I get all of the questions, and I will uh, I will attempt three at a time to uh, to bring them up and answer them for you, uh, or at least get us talking. Right? I feel like that's about that's about the best we can ask for sometimes. So thank you for coming, everybody. Uh, this has been episode number thirty-seven. Uh, it has been, as always, a delight, and I will see you next time. Bye, y'all.